patient hearing and I'm very Here we go. Can you see it now? Please confirm. Great. So this is what Jens Holtz found, that you need a truncated form of GLP-1, and really this is what is synthesized in the body, and then at very, very low concentrations, you can stimulate insulin in the perfused pig pancreas. And we took exactly this form of GLP-1 and infused it to uh, type 2 diabetic patients, and here you can see an original recording from 1992 fasting hyperglycemia, extremely high, 260 or above. And four hours after starting the infusion, it was below 100. And we now know it would not go any lower, even if you continued the infusion of uh, GLP-1. And this got the whole uh, idea started that GLP-1 is a good parent compound for glucose-lowering drugs. And GLP-1 receptors were developed. The first one was a product of serendipity because the saliva of a lizard living in Arizona contains exenatide, which is somewhat similar to GLP-1. It binds to the receptor even better compared to the parent compound. But then people went into the laboratory and designed incretin mimetics. And we have basically two forms of longer acting compounds, the ones that have a free fatty acid residue that would bind to albumin in the body, and then the large proteins like albumin or an immunoglobulin fragment with some GLP-1 modified attached. And they then have had uh, much longer half-lives. Uh, and this is the first progress I can report in the field. So as you can see, exenatide, we are talking about uh, two hours to get to the peak and elimination half-life three to four hours. The next step was towards liraglutide, which could be used once daily and is still a long acting compound. So during these 24 hours, you never have like zero uh, drug concentrations. And then we have seen a number of even longer acting compounds with half-lives uh, just short of a week, but you can never the less use them once weekly. And we have seen one approved oral preparation, again, containing semaglutide plus something else that I will talk about. But what I believe is more important is that uh, over the years after 2007, when the first GLP-1 receptor agonist was introduced, we saw preparations with increasing effectiveness for both glycemic control and body weight loss. Let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, semaglutide for oral use. Basically, uh, you need SNAC, that is another molecule, which is an absorption enhancer that creates a pH and a milieu in the stomach so that the peptide that normally would get digested in the stomach and in the intestines like semaglutide will survive and will be absorbed. So it's essential that you co-formulate semaglutide with this snack. And we have three, seven or 14 milligrams of semaglutide and 300 milligrams of snack per tablet, which means a lot more absorption enhancer. And this is still a vulnerable process. You have to take it in the morning first thing uh, in the fasting state and wait at least 30 minutes before you eat or drink or take any other medication. If you don't do this, the bioavailability is not 1%, which it would be if you comply with these rules, but it would be much less and basically wouldn't work. So, but, but what is really good about the oral semaglutide here shown uh, in blue, that regarding the reduction in HbA1c, it is at least as good as liraglutide. And if you look at body weight reduction, when you compare it to liraglutide, it is even better, uh, which means it has a higher effectiveness in reducing body weight. 
And this is a comparison of all available GLP-1 receptor agonists. And uh, I have tried to estimate the average HbA1c reduction that you get. And this is all from head-to-head -head comparisons between different GLP-1 receptor agonists. And you can see the short-acting compounds are not as good as the long-acting compounds in reducing HbA1c. And within the long-acting compounds, there is one uh, which is no longer available, albiglutide, which is not competitive, but there is one that sticks out, and that is semaglutide for subcutaneous injection. And even the oral semaglutide that is related to the dose that Novo Nordisk has chosen, uh, it is quite competitive with the other long-acting injected GLP-1 receptor agonists. And when it comes to reduction in body weight, there is no general difference between the short-acting and the long-acting compounds. Albiglutide, again, is not competitive in this uh, way. But semaglutide is really much better than any other GLP-1 receptor agonist in reducing body weight and even the oral preparation. Although it is not as effective as the subcutaneous preparation, perhaps again related to the doses, it is at least as good as all the other injected compounds. And what has driven the success of GLP-1 receptor agonists is cardiovascular outcomes trials. Uh, they were not done because people wanted to show that there is some benefit. The companies just had to do them in order to get their drugs approved. And what was found out, and here this is a result of a meta-analysis of all compounds, with the exception of Elixir, which didn't have any uh, benefit in this respect. And you can see that you have an approximately 15% reduction in maize endpoints and in the components of MACE in all-cause mortality, even a slight reduction in hospitalization for heart failure and an improvement in kidney-related outcomes. And this is the comparison to SGLT2 inhibitors, which have similar benefits. The clear difference is with respect to stroke, benefit for GLP-1 receptor agonists, almost no effect, certainly not significant with SGLT2 inhibitors. And the other clear difference is in favor of SGLT2 inhibitors when it comes to the prevention of hospitalization for heart failure and improvement for kidney-related outcomes, especially if you include later stage outcomes like the necessity for renal replacement therapy. I believe that we pretty much understand the process of atherosclerosis. And here you have many steps like endothelial NO production, uh, the uh, invasion of monocytes into the intima, turning into macrophages, foam cells, undergoing apoptosis and leaving lipid drop in the intima, or effects on, on cytokines that uh, are produced by macrophages, or effects on smooth muscle cells in the vessel wall, or on proteases that digest the collagen cap that covers uh, a, a, a plaque before it is able to rupture. And these are all steps in the advancement of atherosclerosis. But now I will show you the same figure. And here you see all those dangerous steps in red. And in the next, you see them all in green. And if you have watched carefully, all the arrows have switched their direction. And this is what the literature says, what GLP-1 receptor uh, stimulation does in a blood vessel. And all these steps are basically reversed, which should lead to a uh, reduction in plaque progression and also in stabilization of existing plaques. So prevention of rupturing, which then causes these events. So I think that is good to know. Regarding uh, adverse events, for a while there was a uh, fear that perhaps 
TLP1 receptor agonists cause acute pancreatitis. And with the help of these cardiovascular studies, now we have really found out that this is not the case. This is a meta-analysis based on these cardiovascular uh, studies. And there were enough events so that we can now conclude there is no elevated risk for pancreatitis. Maybe it is there for DPP-4 inhibitors, but it's very low grade risk. So because of these cardiovascular effects, and you all know the current recommendations from guidelines, it is almost mandatory that someone who is similar to these study patients in having uh, evidence of uh, existing cardiovascular disease, in uh, particular ischemic uh, conditions, uh, coronary disease, peripheral artery disease, cerebrovascular problems. They need a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and some perhaps are better off with an SGLT2 inhibitor, or maybe even with a combination of both. So, and, and this is something that we all wish to see, but it's not true so far. So, the GLP-1 receptor agonists for type 2 diabetes, especially in those in whom the prevention of cardiovascular events is key, uh, is, is not where it should be. So we should talk to our colleagues and hope that they will prescribe uh, these medications to the patients who need them. But as you have seen, there is a significant effect on body weight and so the idea now is that maybe we should not wait before obese people develop type 2 diabetes, but we might be able to use them as anti-obesity agents before that. And the reason is that we have a mechanism. So this is a study from 1998 from Copenhagen. And people received a breakfast and then they were a little bit more satiated, which gets lost over time. And if you infuse GLP-1, they always feel a little bit more satiated. They also feel a little bit more full and they have less hunger during the whole period. And they, if you ask them, how much would you like to eat? They say, well, my prospective food consumption is lower when I'm under the influence of GLP-1. And then they received an ad libitum meal, which really led to satiation and hunger close to zero. And when you now measure the uh, energy that they consumed, it was more with saline than with GLP-1. So they really had a 12% reduction in energy intake under the influence of GLP-1. And you all know that if you eat 12% energy less, this will uh, reduce your body weight. And again, now we are in a position that we understand what is happening there. And we know that the key area in the brain is the hypothalamus, which has several nuclei, and one of the key nuclei is the arcuate nucleus, where there are two types of neurons, and one of them has GLP-1 receptors. We also know liraglutide and semaglutide really reach this nucleus in the hypothalamus. And then uh, the POMC CART neurons are stimulated. They inhibit the uh, neurons that produce NPY and agouti-related peptide, they have projections to other uh, areas of the brain, mainly in the brain stem. So, for example, the lateral parabrachial nucleus, uh, which probably mediates meal termination. So, in the hypothalamus, it is decided that you want to eat and you start your meal and in the parabrachial nucleus, it is decided that you stop eating because you're satiated. And if you take people with obesity, but no diabetes, it works. Here, a high dose of liraglutide was used, and this was a study over uh, three years. 
and you can maintain like a nine or eight percent reduction in body weight over this period and uh, in time. And you can achieve weight loss greater than 5% and approximately 50% and even uh, weight loss greater 10% in 25%. What is helpful in this respect is if you now look for the subjects who will develop type 2 diabetes, if you treat them with placebo, many of them will develop type 2 diabetes over three years, but it's much less when you treat with liraglutide. And the reverse is also true. Uh, with liraglutide, people with prediabetes, IgT, for example, they come back to true normal glycemia, at least two thirds of them do, whereas the number is much uh, lower when you don't treat with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So this indicates you can put off weight and you can uh, at least decelerate the development towards type 2 diabetes. What is important in my view is that you have to continue this treatment uh, for as long as you wish the body weight to be down. This is waist circumference, this is body weight. If you stop after 20 weeks, body weight will start to rise again. Uh, and this is important and, and pa patients should know this. Another complication of obesity is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And there is now a study with semaglutide. Uh, this study was performed with daily injections of low doses of semaglutide. And what is important, the patients had steatohepatitis and some had fibrosis stage F2, F3, as you can see here. So these are the patients that would be on their way towards liver cirrhosis. And when you now measure uh, uh, tran uh, uh, transaminases, they improve. Uh, the greater the dose of semaglutide, the larger the improvement is. And this is true for alanine and aspartate uh, aminotransferase. This now is the primary result. And what they counted is over the period of treatment, how many patients had a resolution of NASH, so no longer steatohepatitis, with no worsening of liver fibrosis. And this is what you see with placebo and with semaglutide. It was always in all three doses significantly better. So you can prevent the, pro uh, the progression of fibrosis, which really brings those patients into trouble. What you cannot achieve is an improvement in liver fibrosis stage with no worsening of NASH. So this is almost the same for all the three groups. Uh, but I think it's important to note that you can prevent the progression of uh, fibrosis. So last, I want to talk about terzepatide, which is a novel agent, perhaps a novel class of agents of dual receptors stimulating the GIP and GLP-1 uh, receptors at the same time. And the idea is a little bit related to the successes of bariatric surgery, which leads to changes in the gut-derived neuroendocrine milieu. We have always talked about GLP-1 and GLP-1 concentrations are sky high after gastric bypass. There is also an elevation in glucagon. Some studies show an elevation in GIP as well. Then there is a dramatic elevation in PYY and GLP-2 levels. GLP-2 is not so much an anti-diabetes or anti-obesity hormone, so it's probably not relevant, but PYY is another appetite uh, inhibiting peptide from the gut. So the combination that Lily chose was uh, a combination of a molecule with uh, some features of GLP-1, other features of GIP, we should note that even GLP-1 and GIP have many amino acids in common, which are shown in the darker green here. Uh, so they are very much related. And terzepatite now has uh, the blue amino acids, which clearly 
indicate they are like GIP, the dark green amino acids, which are both from GLP-1 and GIP, the light green amino acids, which are from uh, GLP-1, uh, some orange amino acids towards the carboxy terminus, which are all from exenatide for certain purposes. Then there is this diacid uh, promoting binding to albumin, very similar to semaglutide and liraglutide. So it's a very colorful molecule. And basically, we have learned it is able to stimulate GIP receptors, maybe even a little bit better than GLP-1 receptors. And now look at one example of a clinical study where patients with type 2 diabetes starting at an HbA1c of 8.3% are treated either with semaglutide, so an established uh, very effective GLP-1 receptor agonist. It's a selective GLP-1 receptor agonist. It does not stimulate GIP receptors. And terzapatide, three doses shown in blue. And when you look at what happens to HbA1c from 8.3 to 6.4, which is excellent for semaglutide, but with terzapatide, it's even better. And the high dose takes those patients to below 6.4 percent uh, at study end after 40 weeks. And you can see that also fasting glucose is extremely well controlled. So in the end, we are talking about uh, fasting glucose in the order of magnitude of 110 milligrams per deciliter. And this taken together means that you can take like 80 or more percent of the patients to an HB1C below 7%. The majority will also make it to below 6.5, but some, and some is many, up to 46% in this study have an HB1C of 5.7 or below, which means this is the range that we would typically call a normal glucose control. So you can turn a type 2 diabetic patient into someone who has normal glycemic control based on HbA1c. And in addition to this, you have a major weight loss. You have the expected 6 kilogram weight loss with semaglutide, but even the low dose of terzapatide is better, and the highest dose takes them to minus 12.4 kilograms, which again means that a majority loses more than 5% of initial body weight, more than half with the highest dose lose 10%, and a substantial number, more than a third, loses 15% of baseline body weight or more. And this weight loss is accompanied by beneficial changes in triglycerides, uh, in overall cholesterol, it leads to a rise in, in HDL and a fall in LDL cholesterol and VLDL cholesterol is also very much reduced. Uh, we have seen a dedicated study in non-diabetic obese subjects uh, that shows even more weight loss. And maybe one thing is worth being pointed out that even after 40 weeks, you have not reached a new steady state. So uh, with all the studies taken together, it probably takes like a year or so before you need uh, you reach your steady state of body weight. There are some initial uh, uh, analyses regarding cardiovascular events. So MACE4 was uh, the, the topic of, of this analysis. This was a study that was performed for two years or some uh, thing longer than that. And here you see the three doses of terzapatide in blue, and especially the high dose, which will be tested in a dedicated cardiovascular outcomes trial, shows a very much reduced incidence of MACE4 events. It's reduced by 50% versus the reference, which is insulin glargine treatment in the control arm of this particular study. And 
when you take the whole trisapatite program of what, what has reported results so far, you can do a meta-analysis of all these clinical trials. And then, for example, you find out that you have a 17% reduction in MACE3, and the upper bound of the confidence interval is 1.18. So this should always be sufficient to have preliminary proof of cardiovascular safety, but it also suggests a chance for benefit uh, if you only examined the right number of uh, subjects. So with this, I will conclude the uh, class of GLP-1 receptor agonists exploits the glucose-lowering potential of GLP-1. And progressively longer-acting and more effective GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists have been developed. There is a first oral GLP-1 receptor agonist, oral semaglutide with SNAC, uh, that is competitive compared to other GLP-1 receptor agonists that need to be injected. They can also be used for the treatment of obesity, and that would prevent the progression from prediabetes to, to type 2 diabetes as well. There seems to be effectiveness regarding non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and in the prevention of fibrosis. The latest uh, novelty is the GIP GLP-1 dual receptor coagonist terzapatite, which in clinical trials has better efficacy regarding HB1C and body weight reduction compared to semaglutide, which is the uh, most effective selective GLP-1 receptor agonists. Other dual and triple coagonists are under development with particular efficacy for weight loss and fatty liver disease. And Incretin-based therapy has proven a potential for further optimization, hopefully towards an efficacy similar to that that we have, see, uh, we have seen after bariatric surgery. Thank you for your attention.